This episode of Yesterworld is sponsored by NordVPN. Go to nordvpn.com slash yesterworld to save 75% off a three-year plan and use code Yesterworld for a free extra month. Finally, Aladdin's on video, and you're invited to join in the fun of the most popular Disney movie of all time. Hang on! On October 1st, 1993, the incredibly successful Disney animation Aladdin was released on VHS. But as thousands of families popped the movie into their VCRs to rewatch the highest grossing animation of all time, they'd get a tease for something even bigger. For the summer of 1994, Disney animators will take you deep into the wilds of Africa for Disney's 32nd all-new full-length animated feature, The Lion King. This was the first glimpse of Disney's upcoming animated feature, The Lion King, promoted as the first Disney animation based off an original story idea. And everything about this film leading up to its release defines the 1990s for many, myself included. From inside looks into the production to iconic music videos, toys, soundtracks, video games, restaurant tie-ins, the list goes on and on. But nothing can even compare to the actual reception when the film hit theaters on June 15, 1994. The Lion King was an immediate commercial and critical success, and would far surpass Aladdin as the highest grossing animated film of all time, a record that would go unchallenged for over 15 years. But with this groundbreaking achievement came a controversy. You must avenge my death, Kimba. I mean, Simba. Newspapers began covering allegations about how Disney's quote, first original story, was stolen from the Japanese animated series, known in America as Kimba the White Lion. Disney, of course, strongly denied these accusations again and again, despite what many thought to be a mountain of evidence to prove foul play. Now, over two decades later, it's time to finally answer the question once and for all, did Disney steal The Lion King? To properly tell this story as honestly and as balanced as possible, we have to go all the way back to Japan in the 1940s, as by this point, America's animation industry had been revolutionized by Walt Disney shorts and feature films. However, overseas, this was not the case. But then came a young cartoonist by the name of Isamu Tezuka, who saw the potential of Japanese cartoons if given the chance. Tezuka's idol and inspiration was in fact Walt Disney himself, and would cite the original Mickey Mouse newspaper strips as a major influence, and the two shared the core belief that animation could appeal to all ages and feature strong characters instead of relying on cheap gags. Tezuka produced many types of comic books during the late 40s and 50s. Some were intended for children, but many appealed to a much wider demographic. He even had the chance to adapt an illustrated version of Bambi, a film he would often cite as another major influence in his career, and claimed to have seen it over 80 times in theaters. But we finally arrive to the one that pertains to our story here, Junguru Taiti, or the Jungle Emperor in English, also known as King of the Jungle. The idea originated, according to the creator himself, from Bambi, as he disagreed with the film's portrayal of intelligent self-aware animals being so removed and distant from mankind. Now, to avoid a lot of repetition between the book and later adaptation, we'll be diving into the specifics of the story a bit later. The series was very successful with children, but its powerful storytelling and strong characters also resonated with older audiences. But it was his next series, The Mighty Adam, otherwise known as Astro Boy, that would take Leo the Lion to the next level. After an unpleasant experience working on the adaptation of a series Son Goku the Monkey King, he began his own animation studio, Mushi Productions. One of the first projects was turning the incredibly successful Astro Boy into a weekly, 30-minute episodic anime TV show, which at the time had never been done before in Japan. To accomplish this, he would abandon the traditional form of Disney animation, instead using as few images as possible to save on money and time. Astro Boy was an unprecedented success and led to a deal with NBC to broadcast the show in English for the US, a first in America's television history. NBC was so pleased with the ratings and popularity of Tezuka's Astro Boy, they also agreed to co-produce a TV series of The Jungle Emperor. This would be the first ever color Japanese animated television show. And in 1965, the show began airing in Japan as Jungle Emperor Leo. However, in America, the show premiered as Kimba the White Lion. Don't worry, we'll explore the name change from Leo to Kimba a bit later. Kimba 
Though not quite as much as Astro Boy, Kimba the White Lion was a success in the US and would air on television mostly up until the mid-70s, with a few stations broadcasting the show up until 1983. However, Kimba's success in America was nothing compared to Japan. Kimba and his animal friends were everywhere, from toys to playing cards, puzzles, plushies, bobbleheads, and much, much more. To put all this into perspective, Isamu Tezuka was often cited as the Walt Disney of Japan, and his characters from Astro Boy and Kimba were the equivalent of Disney's characters in America. In 1966, a summarized version of the show was released into theaters in Japan called Jungle Emperor. The same year saw a sequel series air in Japan, Jungle Emperor Onward Leo, but wouldn't be seen in the US until 1984 as Leo the Lion. In 1988, work began on adapting the later stories of the original manga for a feature-length animated film. However, with the tragic passing of Isamu Tezuka at the age of 60 the following year, the film would spend nearly 10 years in limbo. But over in the United States, another animation began development in 1988, about a young lion whose father dies and is destined to become king of the jungle. I was on a plane with Jeffrey, and, and somehow the topic of Africa came up. And Jeffrey said, that's what we should do. We should do a movie about Africa. The official story is that after this initial discussion, producer Jeffrey Katzenberg added story elements about coming of age and death, and the filmmakers openly cited two major sources of inspiration. One was the story of Moses in the Bible, specifically the elements of Moses being forced to leave his home and returning when he's called to free his people. The other was Hamlet, in which the prince seeks revenge against his uncle, who murdered his father in order to seize the throne and marry his mother. Before I came aboard, it was described as Bambi in Africa with Hamlet thrown in. So, Bamblet. There were days when we went more down the Hamlet path than other days. There were moments when we had lines of Shakespeare into the, you know, into the movie. This leads to something I believe many often miss with this whole Lion King versus Kim of the White Lion controversy. While the influences of Moses, Bambi, and Hamlet can be found from the very beginning, from 1990 until 1993, the script itself went through drastic rewrites. This includes the title, which began as King of the Beasts, becoming the Lion King as early as 1990, then King of the Jungle, before settling back to the Lion King again. It would literally take an entire video itself to go through every single alteration, as most of it is unrecognizable from the final drafts. It was sort of a war between lions and baboons. Rafiki was a cheetah. The character of Scar was actually the leader of the baboons. It was a very different tale. There's a reason why I titled this episode The Lion King Lie, and not something like how Disney stole The Lion King, because when it comes to just the story itself, the short answer is no, and that's actually the least controversial part of this whole situation. So let's take a quick dive into the story of Kimba the White Lion, or Jungle Emperor as known in Japan. Much like the comics, the story more or less begins with Caesar, the king of the jungle. Though he used to guard a village, he moves to the jungle to protect the animals, but becomes a menace to the local tribe when freeing their livestock. The natives' cows and pigs keep disappearing. You mean the white lion eats them? No, he doesn't eat them. He steals them and sets them free in the jungle. In the book, he actually did kill the livestock to provide for his family and animals in the kingdom, but part of the deal with NBC was to tone down the violence. Caesar is killed by a great hunter after they use his pregnant wife Snowin as bait, and his dying wish is for their son to be named Kimba. Snowin is shipped off to a zoo, but on the voyage gives birth to Kimba, and tells him stories about his father and what he stood for. Let's go! Not me. I can't get out of this cage. You must go alone. No! No! I, I can't go without my mother! It's just not possible. You must be brave, my son. It plays out a bit differently in the book, but she tells Kimba he must escape and return to the jungle, and he does so just in time as there's a terrible storm and the ship sinks. Oh, mother! <laughs> While struggling to survive, Kimba's mother appears in the sky and encourages him to keep on going, and eventually he makes it back home. Welcome home, Kimba. We're glad you're back in the jungle. We want you to be our leader. Just like your father Caesar was before. Paui the parrot explains to Kimba that a villainous lion named Claw, who's always defied Caesar for the throne, has taken over since he was killed. I'm going to quickly skip over a subplot of Kimba being captured, being set free by a human, and learning the value of understanding to speed things along. I am Claw! 
I am the king of the jungle. You're a tyrant, Claw, and you're not noble enough to be a king. Ah, you call me the king who'll be sorry. No, I won't. My friend taught me that it's right to fight against injustice. After taking care of Claw, he vows to continue his father's mission for peace. You mean you were actually friends with a human being, but I thought they were our enemies. Not all of them. There are some men who do wrong, but most of them are kind and good, like my friend. We should try to make friends with man because we can learn from him, see? Oh, the animals are just beginning, but we're going to learn to be civilized too. I'm going to take the liberty and assume you're already pretty familiar with the story of the Lion King and can see when it comes specifically to the overall story, they're pretty different. Also, take this line from a story titled The Kingdom of the Lion, which reads, The lion, as king of the beasts, set up a kingdom where he proclaimed that all animals, friends and enemies alike, should live together in perfect peace and harmony. This captures both Kimba the White Lion and the Lion King pretty closely, but that was from a story written over 2,000 years ago. Mix this with the previously mentioned influences of Hamlet and the story of Moses, and you have the story of the Lion King. There's even a deleted scene in which Scar tries to seduce Simba's mother, which is one part of the story of Hamlet they left out. A king alone is a sad situation indeed, but a king without heirs. Now that's a tragedy. You can't be serious. I've never been more serious. The controversy in foul play is the difference between movies like Harry Potter, Star Wars, and The Lord of the Rings. All of them follow the hero's journey storyline down to a T, but it's the world, the characters, the design, the set pieces, and the interactions that make them unique. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what Disney stands accused of stealing, covering up and refusing to acknowledge. Walt Disney Pictures invites you behind the scenes to experience the magic of an extraordinary work in progress. Set deep in the heart of Africa, The Lion King tells the story of the noble young Simba, who's destined to become king of the jungle. Within a matter of weeks after The Lion King opened in theaters, the accusations began pouring in, and for anyone familiar with Kimba the White Lion, this was an open and shut case. The visual similarities are by far the most compelling evidence and are far too frequent and specific to possibly ignore. Coincidence is one thing, but there is example after example after example of just how closely these scenes match to those present in Kimba the White Lion. Both animations even feature a stampede with a character in danger hanging from a branch with a bird character telling them help is on the way. In Kimba it's antelopes, in The Lion King it's wildebeests. Why'd you kick my father's hide? Ow! Jeez, what was that for? But it's really the sequences involving Simba and Mufasa against Scar that, with a little restructuring, are virtually identical of those between Kimba and Claw in the sequel series Leo the Lion. However, keep in mind that Leo the Lion wasn't broadcast in the US until 1984. We'll get to the arguments for and against whether all of this was or wasn't intentional and how it might have happened, but these similarities are pretty incredible. Heck, even Mufasa's death can be recreated using Leo the Lion, though obviously the outcome is far less tragic. And of course, one of the most famous examples is Kimba seeing his deceased mother and father in the clouds, again very similar to the iconic scene in The Lion King. Though it is important to mention that this wasn't part of the script until near the end of the rewrites. One plot thread of Kimba is his goal of turning carnivores into herbivores, and while Simba technically does become a vegetarian, the movie still ends with the circle of life as the main theme. However, thankfully, they left out the most disturbing aspect of Kimba, in which he and the others frequently use his dead father's hide as a disguise and talk to him as if he's still alive. You gotta love children's programming in the 60s. How come you come up with better ideas than I do? Maybe it's because I have a special inspiration, right, father? Now, as far as the characters themselves, Simba and Kimba are pretty different. Kimba is a mature young cub trying to unite the kingdom together in peace. Simba is pretty much the opposite, spoiled, self-entitled, and cocky. By the way, the only reason the name Leo the Lion was changed to Kimba in the first place was because Leo the Lion was the name of MGM's mascot. NBC wanted to copyright the name, so they took the Swahili name for Lion, which is Simba, and put a K in front, either from the K and K NBC or the nickname of an executive's daughter, Kimberly. Kimba. Then you have Mufasa and Caesar, whose morals and personality are nearly identical. You also have Scar and Claw, whose names are quite literally cause and effect, both portrayed as villains with damage to their eye. 
And while their personalities are pretty opposite, as pointed out by author Fred Patton, Scar is pretty much the combination of Claw's hot-tempered nature and the suavely sinister Black Panther. Everyone's saying he's going to be king of the jungle instead of you, Claw. Hmm, like to see him try! This character gives Claw's orders to the laughing hyenas Tip and Tab, and while the Lion King has three, it's a little too coincidental. Although admittedly, the villains are much, much creepier in Kimba. You're a great king, Claw. Kitty! Do you still want to have me as your queen? Mm-hmm. I'd be very happy to accept your proposal, your majesty, and share your throne with you. Zazu and Polly are both birds meant for mostly comedic purposes. The baboons Rafiki and Daniel are also both wise old mentors who guide Kimba and Simba on their journey. There are quite a few more comparisons we could explore, but we also run the risk of trying to say a film like Harry Potter, where a boy who's left in the hands of an aunt and uncle who suppress information about who he truly is and is destined for great things, is copying Star Wars, a film where a boy is left in the hands of an aunt and uncle who suppress information about who he truly is and is destined for great things. But then there's also this. That's why all the others always laugh at me, Kimba. I know my mother must be ashamed of me. And oh, the shame! He was ashamed! What a change in my name! Oh, what's in a name? Once The Lion King was released, Disney's response to the allegations were very inconsistent. First, they claimed to be surprised, clarifying no one associated with The Lion King had ever heard of Kimba or Tezuka's work. Another executive made a statement saying, quote, That period of Japanese animation is scoffed at. However, that contradicts Disney's earlier statements about having no knowledge of Tezuka and his works. Disney soon changed their stance, admitting some of them had heard of Kimba. Anonymous sources who worked on the film, three of which closely involved with producing The Lion King, said they were aware of Kimba during production, calling Disney's claim of ignorance, quote, a bunch of hooey. This really begins to fall apart when looking at the official Lion King press kit, as one of the directors, Roger Allers, lived in Japan for two years, overseeing Japanese artists on a number of animations. There's also Tokyo Disneyland, which required countless executives and a few involved with the Lion King to visit Japan. Remember, Isamu Tezuka was and is considered the Walt Disney of Japanese animation, whose creations became a huge part of their culture and are incredibly well known. I do remember that we were really struggling on Lion King, trying to find a story because in some ways you look at the story and you think, it, it's so new. Nothing about it is, is familiar. It's, it's completely untried, untested. Okay, so now it's time to make some sense out of how all of this happened in the first place, and there's actually evidence to support two separate narratives. Both begin with this. In a very early presentation reel of The Lion King, one particular concept drawing stands out. This has always been considered the smoking gun of sorts, in what seems to be a white Simba, or Kimba. I also came across another example, only this one showing a grown-up Simba. These set up Narrative 1. The Lion King actually began as a Kimba the White Lion retelling. On July 19, 1993, while still in production, Roy Disney gave the equivalent of a Reddit Ask Me Anything for a site called Prodigy Communications. To answer a question about whether there'd be any nice motherly figures, he said, quote, Wait until you see next summer's The Lion King and Kimba's mother. If The Lion King began as a Kimba remake, this would be an easy mistake to make. This would also explain Matthew Broderick's statements, claiming to have been under the impression he was hired for the role of Kimba in a remake of the Japanese animated series. There's also one anonymous employee who claims to have received a letter from a publicist about the quote, remake of Kimba the White Lion we're doing. Going further, in April of 1980, Isamu Tezuka starred in a Disney World television special, playing a character from The Reluctant Dragon. According to his translator, he later visited the Disney Animation Studios in Burbank, California. This adds credibility to the story that supposedly he was meeting with Disney to develop a feature-length remake or retelling of Kimba. In fact, years earlier, he finally met his idol Walt Disney in person at the 1964 New York World's Fair, who praised his Mighty Adam series. Again, this is pretty speculative, but many believe the passing of Tezuka in 1989 put Disney in a tough position. Either abandon Kimba altogether, or make enough tweaks to the story, characters, and animation to avoid outright theft. This might also explain why those who came into the production later would have no idea about its Kimba retelling origins. In retrospect, people go back and analyze the movie and say, oh, how clever they wove in these influences and those influences. If you really saw how the movie was put together, you would say, oh my god, you mean they did it this way? 
But then there's narrative two, which in my personal opinion, based on my research, is the most likely. The origins of the Lion King more or less began just how the creators insist, but, and this is a big but, Kimba was always a massive influence, both consciously and subconsciously. Personally, I truly believe Simba was initially designed to be a white lion as a tribute to Kimba, as based on early concept art, there's no denying this. However, in the same presentation reel mentioned earlier, you do see Simba as a regular lion, and there's a ton of very early concept art showing this as well, so I believe this was abandoned almost immediately. Once the allegations began, a handful of artists and animators went on record to say that, yes, many of those involved were not only aware of the similarities to Kimba, but they embraced it. The production as a whole was unprecedented and chaotic, so it's easy to imagine how a storyboard artist or animator's tribute to Kimba, no matter how obvious, could slip through the cracks by superiors who had never seen the actual cartoon series. Sometimes you don't know really who was responsible for what, because everyone built on the other ideas. You're working very hard to bring in a sequence or to create a background or a layout or a, or a, a moment of animation that's going to um, really wow the people that you respect. When the allegations began, the president of Tezuka Productions initially made a statement, saying they considered it a form of flattery, that Tezuka himself would have been pleased. However, with Disney's repeated dismissals, insults, and unwillingness to acknowledge these influences, they changed their stance. And that's really been the heart of the problem all along. Animators, artists, and fans of Kimba just wanted Disney to pay the same respect Tezuka showed Disney. He often cited Bambi as an influence and inspiration for the Jungle Emperor, so why not reciprocate? To make matters worse, in 1997, Tezuka Productions finally finished and released their Jungle Emperor Leo film that began production in 1988. However, Disney sent the team a cease and desist, claiming they were stealing from The Lion King. Though Disney eventually dropped the case, the marketing team would make a very clear statement years later. The animators who were working for the Walt Disney Studio at that time in the 1990s were the best in the world. Before we wrap this up, I want to make one thing very, very clear. None of this does anything to tarnish, discredit, or undervalue the incredible and groundbreaking work everyone on the team of The Lion King put into the film. From the directors, the writers, storyboard artists, animators, composers, voice actors, and more. The hard work and dedication to achieve such an incredible animated film is not something to be taken lightly. There was a letter that was um, sent to Disney by a man who had lost his wife. And he said, I didn't know what to tell my child, too young to truly understand what death was. And he said, what I did was I tried to explain to them that mommy was gone, but mommy was always looking down on them. It was just really touching. And I think when our films do that, it makes it all worthwhile. Yes, the influences remain controversial, but that doesn't minimize the lasting impact the movie has had on audiences all around the world. Maybe I'm biased, because The Lion King is my favorite animation of all time next to Aladdin, but even with all the similarities we've explored, to label the movie as simply a rip-off is a disservice to all the original work that did go into the film. So at the end of the day, I think it's important to look beyond the controversy itself, and instead focus on what we can ultimately learn from it. Speaking of learning from the past, unless you've been living under a log in the jungle like Kimba, I mean Simba's meal, you're probably well aware about how your online identity is at risk now more than ever. Anytime you're on public Wi-Fi, you never know who could be accessing your data. And even at home you're not safe, since your internet provider tracks your search history and more. But with NordVPN, you don't have anything to worry about. True, some people use VPNs to pirate movies or access content only available in certain regions. But a VPN is absolutely essential for keeping your internet search passwords, and credit card information away from prying eyes. NordVPN offers military-grade encryption, lightning-fast servers, an easy-to-use app for your iPhones, Androids, laptops, and more, and even a 30-day money-back guarantee. If that's not enough to convince you, it's also PC Magazine's editor's choice for best VPN service, and is the one I personally use. Just go to nordvpn.com slash yesterworld, or use the link in the description to save 75% off a three-year plan, and use code YESTERWORLD World for a free extra month.